Hey everyone, welcome to a sneak peek, Ask Me Anything, or AMA episode of The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. At the end of this short episode, I'll explain how you can access the AMA episodes in full, along with a ton of other membership benefits we've created. Or you can learn more now by going to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. So without further delay, here's today's sneak peek of the Ask Me Anything episode. Hey everyone, welcome to Ask Me Anything episode number 31. I'm joined once again by Bob Kaplan, although as you'll learn at the end of this episode, this will be the last time we're joined by Bob Kaplan, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. In today's episode, we talk about really two things in detail. One is HRV, heart rate variability. We've had so many questions on this subject for the past couple of years, and we've just been slowly kind of collecting questions until we thought we had enough to do kind of one of our thematic shows on it. And the second thing we talk about is ethanol, all things related to ethanol. So how does it affect HRV is really our segue, but then also what are the effects of alcohol on sleep? And we really go after mortality, probably where we spend most of our time. And we talk about it through the lens of all of the epidemiology as most of you, or may some of you know, there's a confusing body of literature out there that suggests that maybe some alcohol is good for you and no alcohol is not as good for you. And and so we, we go really deep on this subject matter. So again, if you have any questions about alcohol or if you drink at all, and if you or if you don't drink and you're wondering if you should be drinking, I think this episode will be very helpful for you. So one thing I want to point out for this episode, this episode was just due to some limitations of timing when we recorded it. This was not recorded in video, so we will only be doing this in audio. That might make the show notes a little more important, although we didn't really have a lot of content here that necessitated being able to see. So I think you're going to be fine listening to this in audio, but obviously the show notes will have any of the graphs and other images that we talk about. Now, if you're not a subscriber, of course, you can get a sneak peek of this as usual, and then you'll have to obviously subscribe if you want to enjoy the full content. So without further delay, I hope you enjoy AMA number 31. Hey, Bob, how's it going today? Going well, Peter. How are you? It's good. It's a little unusual today. We're uh, we're doing this a little bit on the old school tip. No video today. We're going to have to be a little bit more descriptive in our terms since people can't watch our facial expressions, although that somehow provided any value. We won't do any screen sharing. I think we can manage. What do you have in store for us today? So I aggregated a whole bunch of questions around HRV, heart rate variability, and alcohol. Many questions on both those topics. I know this has been something you've been asking me about for a year. When are we going to do one on HRV? When are we going to do one on HRV? So (laughs) I think the answer is now. (laughs) All right, we'll dive in. First question seems relevant. What is HRV? And it's funny, this is a tougher question to answer without an image, but I'll do my best. So as you pointed out a second ago, HRV stands for heart rate variability. And that's a pretty descriptive term because what it measures is the variation in time between heartbeats and that's measured in milliseconds. So a thousand milliseconds is one second. So if a person's heart is beating 60 times per minute, you might say, well, there's a thousand milliseconds between every beat, but it turns out that it's not really that way. You see, even if your heart is beating 60 times per minute or once per second, between the first beat and the second beat, it might be 1,010 milliseconds. And between that beat and the next beat, it might be 960 milliseconds. And between that beat and the beat thereafter, it might be 1,027 milliseconds. When you start looking at this thing at the level of thousandths of a second, you realize that there is actually some variability. If anybody has ever seen an EKG, which I'm sure everybody has seen, but maybe you haven't thought so much about what all the little squiggly lines mean, without going into the details of what the P wave and the Q, R, S, and T waves mean, I think most people will recognize that there is a very big spike for each of those beats, and that's actually the R spike. If you now measure the distance between the R's, we call that the RR interval, and you take the root mean square of the successive differences between the heartbeats. So that means you calculate the time difference between each RR interval, 
Each of those values is squared, so multiplied by itself. Then the result is averaged before the square root of the total is obtained. So it's kind of a mathematical method for trying to approximate differences. You get what's called the RMSSD. Again, if you just think about that in units, you took something that was in milliseconds, you squared it, so it became milliseconds squared. You added them all up, it was still milliseconds squared. You took the square root of it, it's back to milliseconds. So RMSSD is reported in milliseconds. If anybody's been paying attention to wearables, a number of these things will calculate your heart rate variability, typically while you're sleeping, and you'll notice it gives you a number in milliseconds. I think prior to the advent of wearables, this was typically just done with an EKG or another sort of chest strap like device that was very accurately measuring the electrical activity of the heart. The next question is probably why do we measure HRV? So you talked about heart rate. I think people would understand measuring heart rate and maybe why that matters, why you might want a lower heart rate in general. Why do we measure HRV? What does it tell us or what can it tell us possibly? As I alluded to above, the heart, even when your heart rate is not changing, and if you're at rest, which is when we measure HRV, so we don't really measure HRV when you're out and about moving around because just the movement itself that you're undergoing is going to change your heart rate. So if I stand up from my desk and go and walk over to the kitchen and do something, well, that's going to increase my heart rate just because I stood up. And if I'm exercising, obviously my heart rate is changing quite a bit. So this is really something that we care about when you're at rest. But as I said, there is variability between those beats. And it turns out that that variability is heavily influenced by which of the autonomic nervous systems is most dominant. So this probably warrants a slight detour. So we have broadly, broadly speaking, two nervous systems. We have one that is under our control and one that is not under our control. And that's a very good thing. If you want to reach for and grab a pencil or walk, obviously that requires voluntary control. You want to be in control of those nerves firing and making muscles do their thing. But you certainly don't want to have to be thinking and consciously making things happen that need to happen constantly. You certainly wouldn't want to have to think about breathing. You certainly wouldn't want to have to think about your heart beating. You certainly wouldn't want to have to think about digesting food. You certainly wouldn't want to have to think about a lot of things that take place beneath the surface. So all of those things are regulated by this thing called the autonomic nervous system. We further divide this autonomic nervous system into two branches. One is called the sympathetic system and the other is called the parasympathetic system. The parasympathetic system, the way we would always learn to remember this in medical school was this was the rest and digest system. So this is the down-regulating system. It conserves energy. It aids in digestion. It slows heart rate. Our favorite little fact was it was responsible for erections, but not ejaculation. Ejaculation somehow came from the sympathetic system. So the sympathetic system, of course, is the fight or flight system. So it's making energy more available. It's dilating the pupils, right? It's getting you ready to see as much information as possible. It's slowing digestion and peristalsis, meaning it's it's slowing down anything that's not essential and it's increasing heart rate. Let's just think about what this looks like from a practical standpoint. If you're laying in bed and you hear a loud bang in your house, you have no idea if it's an intruder or if a picture fell off the wall, but you don't even have to worry about the, Your brain isn't going to even force you to make that decision. It's going to make the decision for you, which is this is a threat. And so your heart rate's going to shoot up. Your pupils will dilate. Any amount of digestive energy going on right now will cease and your liver is going to start cranking out glucose and making you available for fight or flight. Okay, so what does this have to do with HRV? It turns out when the sympathetic system is revved up, HRV goes down. And when the parasympathetic system is in control, HRV goes up. And I think it's easy to think about this, right? As the heart rate speeds up, which is what's happening under sympathetic tone, there's less variability between the beats. When the heart rate slows down, when the body is relaxing, there's more variability between beats. I don't know if that's intuitive or not. I was thinking about that. If you have over the course of a minute and your beats per minute is say, you're, I don't know, Lance Armstrong when he's at the height of his powers. I don't even know what that yeah, is. Probably 30 beats per minute. Yeah. 30. And then you've got somebody else who has hundred beats per minute, just the RR intervals, whatever you call it. There's just less time between them. 
uh, intuitively, I would think there would be less room for variation between each beat, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how strong the correlation is between resting heart rate and HRV. It's almost undoubtedly positive, but I don't know what the R squared is on that. Is that a fair explanation, Bob? Does that make sense on why we would care about uh, HRV? Yes, I think so. As a knock on to that, when you get your HRV output, if it's high or low, what is that telling us? Or how does that inform us? What do we do with that information? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed. The Qualies, which were a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.